In 1961, Marlon Brando tries his hand at directing. The film that he introduces us to is One-Eyed Jacks. This is his only directing credit in his decades-long career. Brando gives a performance as the bank robber called Rio, and he's just hell-bent on getting revenge on his former partner in crime named Dad Longworth, played by Carl Malden. Now, this is a different kind of Western. Rather than placing Rio and Dad on opposite sides, this movie focuses on slowly dissolving the friendship between the two men until there's just nothing left between them except for bitter hatred. The film begins and shows them in Sonora, Mexico, where they have gotten away with a bank robbery, and they're being pursued by the Mexican authorities for this robbery. After Rio's horse gives out, Rio agrees to stay behind while Dad goes ahead just a few miles to find a new horse for his partner. The problem being that Dad ultimately decides to leave Rio behind and run off with the gold that they both stole. Rio ends up getting caught, and he goes to a Mexican prison, and he remains there until he escapes. His rage has just built over the years at Dad's betrayal, and Rio ends up chasing his old partner down to Monterey, California, where he finds that Dad is now a law-abiding sheriff with a Mexican wife and a stepdaughter. The conflict between Rio and Dad completely blows up into a great sequence after Rio kills a man for physically abusing his girlfriend. Dad ties him up in front of the town square and punishes him so that everyone can watch. When you look at this scene, there's no denying that these two performances by Malden and Brando are superb. Dad says with a really cold grin, I'm going to teach you a lesson you'll never forget. And Rio sits there and takes it like a man, with barely a grimace, never once crying out in pain. After Dad finishes this, he leaves Rio with one last cruel act. He breaks his gun hand and therefore strips him of his masculinity. It's pretty obvious, because of a number of things, that Marlon Brando was real inexperienced behind the camera. Now, it's not so obvious to the viewer, but to the people that were on the cast and staff of the film, they knew it immediately. He shot six times the amount of footage that was normally used for a film at that time. He was really indecisive, and he ran over schedule and over budget. Paramount eventually took the film away from him, and they had to recut it all. Marlon Brando's original cut of the film was over five hours long. I've seen some reports where it says that he actually had a film that was about eight hours long. He was terribly upset when they did the cutting themselves, and they cut the film down to 141 minutes. And as you watch the film, especially on the front end of the film, you can tell where the editing has been done. The scenes kind of jump quickly through the process of the plot. But all in all, if you weren't really looking for it, it seems fairly smooth. Marlon Brando drove the crew and the studios nuts. He would just sit for hours at the ocean, waiting for the perfect waves to come so he could get this dramatic shot. And then he would end up missing it and have to do the whole setup over again the next day. There was one scene where he insisted on getting drunk to film the scene in which he was supposed to act drunk. But he got too drunk to act or direct the film. So he ended up repeating this process another day. And again, he got too drunk to direct or act. The filming took an enormous amount of time to complete. The filming started in December of 1958, but the movie wasn't completed until the autumn of 1960. On a budget of $6 million, this film was a huge disappointment at the box office. And to help offset the cost, Marlon Brando persuaded Universal to pick up some of the tab. In return, he agreed to do five films for that studio. 
all five of those films that he did performed poorly at the box office. After buying the rights to the novel, producer Frank Rosenberg worked on the first draft of the script together with Rod Serling. Sam Peckinpah was then brought in to do a rewrite on it. They at first brought in Stanley Kubrick as the director, and then Stanley Kubrick ended up firing Peckinpah, and he then brought in Calder Willingham for more rewrites. But later on, the producer Rosenberg fired him and hired Guy Trosper instead. The movie itself has very little resemblance to the source novel that was used for the screenplay. That novel was called The Authentic Death of Henry Jones. The character of Rio originally was based on Billy the Kid. Sam Peckinpah, who wrote the earlier version of the script, and who later went on to direct Pat Garrett and Billy the Kid in 1973, said in an interview that Marlon Brando couldn't play a good villain, and Billy the Kid was most definitely a villain. Peckinpah's 1973 film shares a lot of elements with this film, and it also features two of the same co-stars, that being Slim Pickens and Katie Girardo. Now, one thing I find that's kind of interesting is that when Stanley Kubrick was in charge of the thing, he originally wanted Spencer Tracy to play the role of Sheriff Dad Longworth. But Marlon Brando, whose production company already had Carl Malden on salary, refused to replace him with Tracy. This was the beginnings of the conflict that Kubrick had with the production company. Now, I guess they had a birthday party for Marlon Brando on the set. And the crew gave him a belt that had a card on it that read, Hope It Fits. A sign was then placed below the birthday cake saying, Don't feed the director. But they did. And it said that he ate four pieces of cake that day. It's also been noted that he would just pig out on meals. And they constantly had to make adjustments to his costumes. Because Carl Malden said he would sit there and eat two steaks at dinner, potatoes, two slices of apple pie, and drink a quart of milk to wash it all down. It was widely reported that Marlon Brando behaved in a really harsh way to his female co-star, Pina Pelsier. He would yell and scream at her and tell her that she was a bad actress. He was doing this to push her to cry, to obtain exactly what he wanted from her on film. And it must have worked because this girl does an exceptional job in this movie. She, in reality, was very well known in Mexico. But this film was her only U.S. performance. You see, she was the daughter of a real affluent family in Mexico City. But I'll tell you what, she gives one of the best female performances in this film that you will see. And this really is not an overstatement at all. She seems extremely vulnerable and very real in this role. This girl had the ability to turn it on and grab you into the scene. She completely holds her own with Brando, like I've never seen another woman do. And there's no doubt this girl would have gone places in Hollywood had she not have taken her own life shortly after this film. She was only 30 years old, and nobody really knew exactly what happened. But there were some theories. A lot of people thought that this is just another case of life imitating art. Some people tend to think that because of the storyline of the movie, that she and Brando really had their own real-life case of a man snubbing a leading lady. But I really don't think this is the case, because she died a few years later, after she had had this on-screen relationship with Brando. Other rumors state that she wasn't hung up on Brando at all, but that she was bugged by the same sort of difficulties that Montgomery Cliff lived with, and the resulting depression made her bow out early. And I'm pretty sure that's what happened. According to Marlon Brando's longtime secretary, she stated that Pina was a lesbian, and she mentions this in her book, when they're discussing the production of this film. It's thought that a breakup with another woman left her extremely depressed and led to her actions that day. 
The one thing I can tell you about this is that we missed a lot of good performances that would have come from this lovely lady. Besides the tension between Rio and Dad that just fuels this film, One-Eyed Jax has some of the most beautiful filming locations that were ever used in a western. In particular, the coastline scenes are just gorgeously shot with Technicolor, and they're presented in the widescreen version called Vista Vision. After the critical and commercial failure of One-Eyed Jax, Brando's career didn't pick up again until over a decade later in the movie The Godfather. I really enjoy this film. It's fun to look at because the cinematography is so great, and Brando's an excellent actor along with his co-stars. And don't get me started again on Ben Johnson, because anything that Ben Johnson is in, you're going to see my seal of approval. He just ratchets everything up a notch, and you'll find he plays a totally different role than you're used to seeing him in in this movie. Take a look at it. I think you'll enjoy it. Thank you so much for watching, and we'll continue to chase the classics.